Listen, I think we're all on the same boat here when we say there's been, been plenty of tests in our lives. Did that end when you gave your life to King Jesus? <laughs> you said, no, I think it actually increased. Yeah. If not, then maybe you've just been wearing church clothes and not necessarily being clothed with Christ. Is obviously where we've been for a couple weeks. We're going to look again to the story of Joseph in Genesis chapter 37, and we're going to end up in Genesis chapter 42 is where we're aiming this morning. But before we get there, as we were in worship, I was reminded of Matthew 5. Matthew 5 and verse 3 said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they are they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Interesting. Not inherit heaven, but inherit the earth, right? So heaven's not your destination, right? At best, it's a cul-de-sac, and we're right here again for eternity, ruling and reigning with King Jesus. The reason I was uh, brought to that scripture and reminded of that is because we've been studying Joseph. Many of you understand and know that Joseph began favored by his earthly father, had a coat of many colors, right? And then sold into slavery by his brothers and many, many, many uh, opportunities came his way to deny the Lord or actually trust in him. You ever been there? But what we see and we're going to be reminded of this morning is we understand the story of Joseph and how he ends up ruling and reigning on the earth. Phenomenal, inspirational story, right? No, that's supernatural. What he is doing when he is in that place is being in a place where he has now been made meek. Do you know what meek is? Meek is power under control. You see, you've been given the power of the Holy Ghost. You've been given the word of God itself, but you also been given the spirit of self-control. How many of you know stupidity is not a gift of the spirit? How many of you know that a lack of self-control is not a gift of the spirit? Oh, we love the presence of God. We love to float in our Christianity. But I mean, the word of God is kind of just over here for the scholars. <laughs> no, the word of God nourishes you. It's the lamp unto your feet. It's the constitution of your soul. It's the direction for your new man. Last week, we talked about the nature of the beast, the identity of what we once were. And Romans 8 told us that we weren't even allowed to participate with that thought. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that this morning. You can put your finger in Genesis 42 where we're going, but before we get there, we're going to walk through a couple scriptures. Can we do that? This morning, we're talking about tested and approved. Listen, that's not tested and reproved. You understand what reproved is? Reproved has to do with correction, disapproval, and scolding. And because of your lack of understanding or perspective towards the Father who you think is sitting in the heavens with a gavel and a black coat ready to spank you when you get something wrong, you think when I say approve, I'm talking about reproved. So we don't understand when we say the word testing, we think of negative. It's not, it's positive. It's a very positive thing. And you want to be attested or tested. Don't you want to be approved too? <laughs> don't you struggle with that most of the time? Listen, I know the word says that I'm a son and daughter of the living God, but listen, I don't necessarily feel approved today. Yeah. Well, maybe it's because of your reactions or maybe it's because of your unbiblical understanding or lack of doctrine. Are we waiting for our pastor to do it for us? Are we waiting for our teachers to accomplish things for us? Or can we actually be accountable to the word of God ourselves? We can. You host the same presence of God that I do. You have the same Bible in your hand that many shed their blood to get to you in your hand. You are, Ephesians says, those who do the work of the ministry, not us who stand behind the pulpit. The equippers working together with the equip, accomplishing the ministry right here in this city. Amen. When's the last time that you walked into a place and they actually challenged you, encouraged you? You can do what I do and do it even better. Well, I hope it was sometime soon because you might have deemed the doors of a church. If not, then yeah, I'll leave that for you. You are receiving affection from heaven. Around here we say correction is affection. Yeah, yeah okay. 
<laughs> You're receiving approval and testing from your father. I love what Genesis has shown us so far. We, we, we enter the story of Joseph. We see his father, Jacob, and Jacob was a dreamer, but Joseph was a dreamer as well. And all of a sudden we realize that our father has a dream for us. To become just like his son. Do you know that God dreams for you? He desires for you and wants you to come to a place. It's called being conformed to the image of his son. You know why that's a beautiful thing? Because his son is the most intimately and personally known. And you want to be known, don't you? Yes, you do. Let me give you a recap for a minute. Joseph was a dreamer. He was favored our favorite son, born into dysfunction. Do you remember that? Sold into slavery by the uprising of his flesh and the uprising of the flesh of his brothers. Stripped of his favor by the nature that we call the beast. You know, that old man that you used to be. That thing that you think's okay to date but ends up devouring you. Then he's found lonely, confused, desperate in the bottom of a man-made cistern. In a dry and lonely place, have you ever been there? In a wilderness where he learned not to identify with the nature of his old man or the nature of the beast that took part, just take note, that to get him there, but rather to identify with the father who he could call on for rain and to get him out of that place. Because that was the only opportunity to get out of a hole if you're in a desert that you can't climb out of, think out of, call for help out of, you have to call to the one that can send rain. And you need a lot of it, don't you? You need a lot of rain to fill up a big hole so that you can float out of that place. Hmm. Ephesians 2.1 says this. As for you, say, who me? me? Yeah, I'm talking about you. As for you, you were dead in your transgression and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time. Watch this. Gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature or feeding that beast. And following the desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by object, by nature, objects of wrath. Wow. Galatians 5.17 says, but... Because of the great love of God, who is rich in mercy, he made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in transgression. So who was first? Christ Jesus was first. So what does it take for you to love like Jesus loves? Be first. Are you waiting for carnal compensation? Are you waiting for somebody else to do something in order that you might be like Jesus? Because you're going to keep waiting. It is by grace that you have been saved and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms. In Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages, take note of that for a minute. There's some ages to come. You call that eternity. He might show his incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, but it is a gift of God, not for your good behavior, just a gift. Not by works, so that one can boast. Watch this. For we are God's workmanship. Yeah, that means he's working on you. Yeah, you might actually look like that piece of metal there. Some of us feel like that some days, don't we? Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, watch this, which God prepared in advance for you to do. Did you know that he has work for you to do? Oh no, he, you didn't get saved by work, but he definitely saved you to get to work. And you can bear witness to that because you know today he's already working on you. So you just do what the Father does, right? Yeah. Saints, your salvation is not your destination. We've said that many times. It is your in, uh, initiation into a divine nature. The invitation to walk with God. Do you want to walk with God? Yeah. Do you want to walk this way? Anybody know what Aerosmith is? I think he was on to something. <laughs> it is also a release from the beast. And boy, do we need that into a life of restoration and reconciliation. Anybody need some? I need some. A supernatural way of life. That means beyond what your schedule can do. Beyond what you feel like you can do. Think what you can do. 
an ability beyond yourself. When you look behind you and go, man, that happened? You went, there was no possible way that that happened. The only possibility was God being in the impossibility and working through this common man. Into a life of peace, love, and joy in the Holy Ghost, empowered to live a life holy and pleasing to the one who set you free. When I say set you free, does that bear witness to you? Or is that something you're looking forward to? Hmm. You don't have to. You can be set free. Saints, not a life lived only for the here and now, but also what your Bible says, a life lived for the age to come. Eternal minded, not temporal minded. How many of us live that place in a survival mentality, living a substandard way of life instead of living for the age to come? Do you know what I mean? Are you just waiting and sitting, soaking and souring and waiting to get to heaven? Or are you living for the age to come because you know how you respond now determines how you live for eternity? Do you think that way? Listen, I could kind of skirt by and get by. Jesus loves me. Or I could actually press in, be tested, feel approved. Because in the age to come, that's going to determine how I live and what I do, where I do it. Hmm. Saints, this is a life lived like a dressing room. You understand that? The life that you have been given is a gift. The life that you have been given has a window of time. The life that you have been given is a temporary gift from God. Can we agree on that? The life that you have been given is dressing you for eternity. The life that you have been given is on loan to you with an expectation from the investor who invested in you. Are you with me this morning? The life that he's been, that you've been given is a test for you. Saints, will that life that you've been given be the one that you look back on and say, listen, I love the gift more than I love the giver. Or will it be one in the end where you say, listen, I understood all all that this world could give and life was a blessing and all good and perfect gift come from above. But I'm going to be honest, I love the gift that he gave me much more than I loved him. That'll say something about you, won't it? Well, Jesus marked that when he said in Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone loved would come after me. He must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And the one well, who li- loses his life, then he'll save it. He's only trying to get us to a place where we love the giver more than we love his gifts. I mean, he is your father, right? And if you love the gifts better than the giver, then he becomes your sugar daddy. Not your king of glory. Saints, life is not a bait and switch from God, but it definitely has its temporary or temptations, if you would, to hold on to the temporary elements. You ever feel that? But what you're doing is you're exchanging the temporary, right, for eternal quality of life in eternity. And we need to learn not to do that. Can we do that this morning? Well, you start here. Life is a gift. We understand that life is from God and life is a test. Your entire life is a test. Like you're staring in a dressing room, right? And you're like, "Mm, I don't like that. If it's a little, no, I'm going to take that off. I'm going to put something else on. Yeah. Amen. You're going to put on Christ. Time will come to an end, but your life will go on. When time has ended and eternity has begun, will you find Christ formed in you? Because it's the only factor that will stand the test of time that your Bible says is coming. A fiery trial that will come upon this earth. Did you know that that's what's happening? 2 Peter 3.3 says, You must understand that in these last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, Where is this coming, you promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget... That long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. 
By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, this pre the present heavens and earth, well, they're reserved for fire. You see, for me, that doesn't sound scary. You know why? Because I live a life baptized in fire, forged in fire. It's where I live. Let's call this kingdom. Saints, the day of the Lord is like a refiner's fire. The only people who will be able to withstand it is those who have already been baptized in fire. Forged by the hand of God. This is why God himself tests you. Oh, I thought that was Satan's job or man's job, you know, because they really get on my nerves. <laughs> no, my friends, it is God. When God is forging you, he is making something faithful out of you, something that you were not previously. Second Peter 3.10 says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear in the, in, in the, with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire in the earth and everything in it laid bare. Flipped upside down, filleted before the Lord, exposed on everything. The light will expose every deed while done in the body. Every single one of them. Are you excited about that? Oh, amen. Good. Well, that's the voice of those who are forged in fire. Saints, you ought to be firebrands. You see this picture on there? That's a, a firebrand. You know what a firebrand is, right? Something that, that is set on fire and then it sears and makes an impression. You are called to make an impression on your generation, not just float through it. You are called to make a mark on the atmosphere that you walk in, not leave it the same. You are light and there's much darkness out there. So when you walk into the room, what do you expect darkness to do? Flee. So why is it that we flee, though no one is pursuing? For we're the righteous, Proverbs says, and we are bold as lions. The word of God, saints, is an anvil. You know what an anvil is? That's that thing underneath that glowing piece of metal. The word of God is an anvil. The hammer is the trials and tribulations of this world. So what does that make you? You're that thing in between. You ever feel that tension? I'm getting it from every side. <laughs> Man, what is going on? Oh, maybe the meek will inherit the earth, not just King Jesus himself, and he is making you capable and able to do so. In the end, saints, the anvil of the word of God will wear out the hammers. And you would have been forged in fire by the process, able to withstand the purifying fire to come because you yield it to the process of God who tests your metal. Did you know that he gave you a backbone of steel, a heart like a lion? Because if you don't know that, that's why he's testing you so that you will come to that conclusion so that the enemy no longer steals your confidence, but you know not only who you are, but whose you are and who lives in you. This is allowing him to fit you for the age to come. In verse 11, he says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you be? What kind of people ought you be when you're thinking eternal minded of the day to come that he will, that he will purge the heavens and the earth with fire and the only ones who walk through are those who are already been forged? What kind of people ought you ought to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day that God comes with speed. That day will bring about destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. Watch this. The home of the righteous. What does Proverbs say? The righteous are bold. The home of the bold. When are we going to stop apologizing for our love for Jesus? Do you do that? I'm sorry. Listen, I got to tell you about Jesus, but did you just leave with I'm sorry? You're not sorry. You're a saint. You're a son and daughter of the living God. And you walk in confidence. Why? Because you feel approved because you've been tested 
and brought out to that place in which God is bringing you. The age to come, saints, will be lived here and renewed on earth, where heaven will reign and the righteous will live. Those righteous will be bold men and bold women, branded with a fiery love for King Jesus. Romans 16.10 talks of a man named Apelles, and he says, Apelles is a man tested and approved in Christ. Wow. Is that what you want to be, saints? Do you want to be tested? <laughs> Do you want to be approved? Yeah. Oh, well, if you want to be approved, you have to be tested. <laughs> God himself has given you time to purify yourself of the lingering effects of the nature of the beast that you used to sleep with. Oh, you know who I'm talking about. He still purrs at you sometimes. <laughs> King Jesus, Jesus Christ, his son, is the model standard that is testing the quality of your character. Is it his character or is it yours? And when he tests you, he is showing you, blessing you, gracing you with eyes to see and hearts to understand. King Jesus will never leave you, never leave you right? Isn't that great words that we love to hear? He'll never leave me nor forsake me. Praise the Lord. He will not never leave you. That is true. He'll not forsake you nor leave the work that he began in you undone or unfinished. Don't you know he's a finisher? Yeah. Yes. He's the author and perfecter of your faith. He's the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. And he will complete in you what he started. So it's good that you decide not to kick against the goats. He has even shared his Holy Ghost with you. Is that true in here? Yes. Yeah in order that he would abide with you. You know what abiding is? That's a 24-7 thing. It's in a Sunday Christian thing. This is 24-7. I'm all in. I'm not ankle deep, waist deep, knee deep. I'm all in. I'm in over my head. I'm too far gone. There's no hope for me. The only hope is King Jesus. Hmm. Saints, it's like you were his bride and you have been taken from his side like Eve was only to be brought back in union with him as one. Yeah. Second Peter 3.10, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to be firebrand. You ought to be tested and you ought to be approved. First Corinthians 3.10 says, but each one of you should be careful how he builds. Builds what? His life. You've been given a soul. It belongs to the Lord. This flesh will perish. Your soul will live on. And you got to ask yourself, am I polishing it, putting jewels on it, and put it back in his hand better than which he gave it to me? Because on that day, you are going to look King Jesus face to face. Whether you serve him or not, you are going to look him face to face and give the investor his investment back. For no one can lay any foundation other than that which is already laid, which is Christ Jesus. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stone, wood, hay, or straw, maybe even some church clothes, they're going to be burned away. Careful what you're wearing. His work will be shown for what it is because the day will be brought to light. It will be revealed by fire, and the fire, watch this, will test the quality of each man's work. Not the quantity, the quality. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. Watch this, because you think I'm, I'm talking about saved, unsaved right now. He will be saved himself, but only as one escaping through the flames. He's talking about those who love King Jesus. He is talking about the redeemed. He's talking about you, those who have given their life to the Lord. What kind of life are you living? Is the life you're living worth King Jesus dying for? Hmm. If you're feeling conviction this morning, then you should praise the Lord. Because let's be honest, you've spent too much time feeling condemnation. And that's not for the sons and daughters of the living God. But conviction is, it's the very thing that sparks like defibrillators on your heart and makes you get up and do something with the salvation you've been given. But only as one escaping through the flames. Ask yourself this morning, are you 
allowing God to temper your temptations, to live for temporary things? Do you live for the temporary? Do you actually survive and call it thriving? Oh man, you've lowered the bar, my friends. Or are you submitted to the testing that will leave you ready for his return and approved to rule and reign with him? Because that's what Joseph was doing. Galatians 4.19, Paul says, he is personally in pains until Christ is formed in you. If Paul feels like that, how do you think the king of glory feels? James 1.2, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For because when he has stood the test, he will receive a crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Wow. Saints, in this world, we test each other out like a cheap pair of clothes, don't we? Oh, I'm sorry. That's a little too close to home. Our relationships. We have a culture, right, where we we, we date each other instead of commit. Where'd you get that from? I don't think you got it from the model that King Jesus laid for you. He committed before you actually displayed any godlike character. In this world, we test each other out like a cheap pair of clothes that you see. Whether or not we do this to see whether we're valuable enough to actually retain or keep. Or pleasing enough or desirable enough to keep and then decide whether or not we should actually Continue with each other. But Jesus does not do that. And neither should you. He chose you, right? You didn't choose him. That's what the Bible says. And he has no intentions of discarding you. Even when you're wicked towards him. Hmm. But rather he is testing you to temper your metal that you might have the spiritual fortitude to remain his bride the whole time. He has been doing this ever since the beginning. Do you know that? Do you know that he's been tested? Do you know that your Bible says you have the faith of Abraham, right? Genesis 22, 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, and we know that he asked for his one and only son. Says this is where Abraham went from being called out to being called upon. From being called out to being called upon to be fit to carry the promise that you benefit from today. In Exodus 15, 25, there the Lord made a decree with his people. He made a decree and the law for them. And there, watch this. Guess what he did? He tested them. He said, if you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, and if you pay close attention to his commands and keep his decrees, I will not bring you any of the diseases I brought the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Maybe some of you haven't been wounded and somebody stuck a hot iron in it to fix it. Maybe they should have. At least it would have been a little more shocking and the reality might have stuck when you were healed. God tested his family and said, if you carry out my commands, I will heal your diseases. Plural, diseases. You thought you had one disease, the old man. <laughs> Wake up. Romans 12, 1, therefore I urge you, brothers, in the view of God's mercy, watch this, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your reasonable act of worship. Wow. Wow. What is the problem with the living sacrifice saints? You know it. They have the propensity to crawl off the altar. God left you with a with an opportunity and an option on purpose to test you. Job 23.8 says, But if I go to the east, he is not there. And if I go to the west, I do not find him. When he is at work in the north, I do not see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. But, say but, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth like gold. Do you know that King Jesus is trying to extract the gold out of you? 
and he's not waiting till heaven to do so because he wants you to be valuable to this earth. You're already valuable to him. It is not only a test, but it is also the time of forging when you trust what you cannot see that God is doing in your life. First Peter 1 Peter 1.6, are you with me? 1 Peter 1.6, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer all kinds of trials and even grief, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor the King Jesus when he's revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Is that you? Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible, glorious joy. (laughs) Oh, amen is right. Psalm 66, 8, praise our God, you peoples. Let the sound of the praises of God's people be heard. He has preserved our lives and keeps our feet from slipping for you Oh, God tested us and refined us like silver. You are like precious jewels being extracted from the earth. You are like fine gold that God is extracting right here and right now so that you might know how valuable you are and that you might be valuable to someone else. How long have we been waiting for somebody else maybe the ministers, even the pastor or your leaders in your life, to do what God's asked you to do? Be like Jesus. Saints, trial and tribulations are the means to glorious triumph. And there is no testimony without test. Isaiah 28, 16. So this is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, for a sure foundation, the one who trusts will never be dismayed. Saints, King Jesus is that tested stone that the prophet speaks about, a foundation stone for his living stones to be built upon. One house, one people, one kingdom for the glory of one name, King Jesus. Isaiah 48, 10 says, See, I have refined you, though not as silver, I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Come on, Showbird household. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do this. Twice God says, for my own sake, I do this in you. (laughs) How can I let myself be defamed? I will not yield My glory to another, Isaiah 48, 10. For we have been studying the life of Joseph, and he is now going to show us something new today. Joseph's name meant fruitful. Remember that? You want to be fruitful? Do you want to produce fruit for King Jesus? Well, Jesus says you must be fruitful. James 1, 12. You can turn there for a minute, and then we're going to end up In Genesis 42. Although many of you have your mind already on a spicy affair happening after church, let me tell you that James 1, 2 is about to get that as well. Very spicy. James 1, 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test... He will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Listen, in Genesis 37, where we've studied through already, Joseph is stripped of his father's favor, persecuted, abandoned, sold into slavery by his closest brothers. Have you ever been there? And he is tested by the impossible situation of a lonely desert cistern. By the time we get to Genesis 39, just a Two short chapters ahead, Joseph is brought brought back from slavery and into servitude of Potiphar's house. Potiphar, the the leader of Pharaoh's guard, until he was tested by Potiphar's seductive wife and unjustly imprisoned, watch this, 
for his integrity. How many of us haven't been in prison for our integrity? Oh, then we got some work to do because so was Jesus. Saints, we need some Josephs here today. We need some men who have been tested and approved, tested in their integrity. I don't know if you, maybe I'm, maybe, maybe I'm preaching poorly today. We need some Josephs here today that will rather be in prison than sell their integrity for pennies on a dollar. You know what I mean, right? Who would rather give away their rights of gain than sell out for a virtual quickie when no one's looking? Yeah. Yeah, when no one's looking. Joseph reminds us that integrity is measured by what you do when no one's looking. By the time we get to Genesis 39, did you know that men like Joseph, men with Christ-like integrity, will take a prison house and turn it into a palace? If you don't know that, then you should read the chapter and ask the Holy Ghost to show you. Husbands, let me ask you something. Does your wives feel like a warden or do they feel like queens in your house? Singles, does your life look more like a prison house than a daily prayer house? A daily praise house? Maybe it's because you have been a peasant in your identity. Maybe it's because you have a peasant prison mentality, so... You bring that culture wherever you go. But you must be like Joseph this morning. Stop selling out your integrity. Live for honor. Walk in the favor that has never left you. You see, it never left Joseph. Just because he was stripped of his father's favor in the coat, the favor of God actually never left him. The power of the Spirit never left him. The identity of a true son never left him. So what does he do? He makes those type of places, whether a prison or a palace, a place for God. He makes it a house of God, a place where he was receiving testing, became a place of testimony that God would extract his glory. I told you we were going to get to Genesis 39 and we're there. Let's start there. But while Joseph was there in prison... The Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison ward. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all of those held in prison. And he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because why? The Lord was with Joseph and he gave him success anywhere that he went. That's amazing. In Genesis 37, the coat that represented the favor of the father was stripped from Joseph, but the father's favor itself never went anywhere. When you find, saints, yourself in your own personal prisons, the times that you want to forsake him, is God testing your trust in him, or are you being tempted to believe that he has forsaken you? To place your father's Name in an attribute that's not his own is a place of temptation, not testing. Say, I don't want you to think this morning that temptation only happens in the realm of sexuality or sensuality. Just ask Eve when she was dragged away by her fantasies or her big ideas. It's much more than that. Listen to what James 1.13 says. Can I walk you through for a second temptation so that you can see that it's not testing? And can I compare the two this morning for you? Yeah. James 1.13, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each of you, when tempted by his own evil desire, is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Let me help you out here for a minute. God cannot be lured into your temptation. You know what, no, you know what is good about that? Number one, that means that 
He is not involved in your temptation. Number two, he remains the outside source to open up a way out. Our Father who is in heaven, right? Hallowed be your name. Lead us not into the temptation of the evil one. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 says, run from sexual immorality. It's not even a fight that you should be having. It might not look like sexual temptation, but it always comes with the same base nature. What? Temptation. James 1, 13, be tempted. All right, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me for God. Cannot be tempted by evil, nor is he, does he tempt anyone. Watch this. Let me help you. Number one, when tempted, what is it that's tempting you? Your own evil desires. You know what this word is in the Greek? Strong longing. You have a strong longing in the moment. You know what the word is saying here? It's not God and it's not the devil. We're blaming the devil for something. The origins are of us. Number one, your own evil desire. It is not your nature of the beast, according to Romans 8, that God enters in with. It's your own responsibility. Romans 8 told us that we are not even allowed to identify with it. What? That desire. That means no flirting, no dating, no one night stands, not even remembering what you once were, but rather remembering who he was the first time that he showed up to deliver you. The evil desire that you have in your heart that you meditate on for three seconds is like the same time. You know what three seconds is? One, two, three. That evil desire is like the three seconds that you take to send a text to an old lover. That's how long it takes. The time that it takes to click on that not so dangerous video ad. One, two, three. The time that it takes for you to turn your God given neck. Maybe when you're in a CrossFit gym. One, two, three. Gotcha. Hmm. Or the time that it takes to purchase that want that you think it's a necessity or that time that it takes to release those words that you cannot get back. You are by your own evil desire, your strong longing within three seconds, then James says, dragged away. Hurried away until a willing desire now takes you to a place, taking you from one position to another. You go in your own evil desire, now hurries you away in a willing distress, this Greek word says, in your own thoughts, or maybe in your own mind, or even physically and willing, why? Because your base nature wants you to go there and be put into a position. Why? Because that is the place where you can be, James says, enticed. So your own evil nature, right, now drags you away. And then what happens next? It entices you. Know what that word is in the Greek? Baited. Trapped. Bait. He baited you, hooked you, and brought you away. The place you thought you wanted to go, the place you were sure that was God. Because the, the nature of the beast, are you with me, Pastor Kaysen? The nature of the beast will bring you where you do not want to go. It'll keep you there longer than you want it, and it'll leave you farther than you ever imagined it could. Then after this happens, James tells us, now that you're far away from the Father, in James 1.15, after this, he says, after desire has conceived, he gives birth to sin. Sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Wow, what kind of language does that sound like? Well, he tells you. Desire is a strong longing that brings you to a nasty little motel hotel. Desire is that place, and then it does something. It conceives something. It conceives a life of its own, a secondary identity of its own called sin. And that sin... The intention in your heart that you thought was God now produces a baby, and that baby is called death. And sin always comes with a name, intention, and power. And now you got something in your hands you got to deal with. Why? Because by your own evil desire, you were dragged away, enticed, 
conceive the little baby, and now you get to raise it. Or you get to give it to God and see that he might put it to death. James 1.13, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. God is not in this. He's outside of that and bringing you to a place that is not there. Saints, temptation is not from God nor a tool that he uses. Why? Because temptation takes you out of the testing. Are you with me this morning? Yes. Temptation takes you out of the testing and you want to be in the testing. Your life is a test telling his story in the realm of time. Soon it will be over though. And you want that story to be one that you said yes to. Am I right? Yeah. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is good news for you. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when tempted, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Wow, that's amazing. Apparently God knows you better than you know yourself. Or better yet, he knows what he has invested in you, his son, his self. Do you believe that about yourself? Do you understand that about the reality that when you gave yourself to King Jesus, it wasn't just a good old boy getting better on a day that he prayed a little prayer where he lifted his pinky at front when some man deemed him saved? Or did King Jesus actually take you more seriously than you have taken him since then? Well, you can rectify that today, saints. Wow. Let me do this for you. Let me actually bring you to Genesis and stay there so that we can wrap this up. Hmm. I love what it says in Genesis 42. In Genesis 42, 8, although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. And then he remembered the dreams that he had about them. So let me catch you up to speed. Joseph has been sold out by his brothers into slavery. He is sold into servitude. He is taken from servitude into prison, from the prison house to the palace. And now he is ruling and reigning at the right hand of the ruler of the entire world. And the dreams that he had were actually now being fulfilled. The brothers in which that dream included are now standing before him because of a famine. He's standing before him, not knowing that it is him, and he is now going to begin to do something for them. Why? Because he remembered the dreams that he had for them. He remembered the dreams that God gave him that included them. Do you know that King Jesus has dreams for you? Do you know that he wants those dreams to become reality? Do you know that his sovereign hand is the one that is ruling over you. And in order to get you to that place, he must test you. Genesis 42, 8, although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Man, we sit at that place a lot, don't we? Then he remembered the dreams that he had about him, his God-given dreams. Wow. James 1.16 says, Do not be deceived, dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us new birth through the word of truth that he might, that we might be a kind of first fruits, first fruits of the creation. Hebrews 2.11 says, Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are the same family. Watch this. So that Jesus is not ashamed to call you brothers. What? He's my king, he's my friend, and he's my brother? Yeah. Joseph is one of the most phenomenal types and shadows of King Jesus in your Older Testament. And here, Joseph sits in front of his brothers, ruling and reigning the entire world, just like you sit before King Jesus, your brother, who is reigning, ruling and reigning over the entire universe. And like Joseph, he tests you. And like King Jesus tests you, Joseph's about to test his brothers. Isn't it important for us to see what it looks like? Watch this. After much testing and preparation, like Jesus, Joseph was already ready to test his brothers. You know, in Genesis 39, it says his, that 
Joseph was brought to a place where his character stands out as one of the purest in history. He allowed no temptation to affect his high morality, no calamity to shake his implicit faith in God, no adversity to depress him, no power or position to make him proud or haughty. In his father's house, he had likely been pampered, but in slavery, he was falsely accused. In the palace, as the ruler of what was the greatest kingdom on the earth, he was always the same truthful, pure, just, merciful, kind, and God-fearing man. And he was about to make sure his brothers were as well. In Genesis 42, 7, Joseph makes himself a stranger to his brothers, accusing them of being spies. Let me ask you something this morning. Have you ever been undergone false accusation? Then you need to be encouraged. Jesus is testing you. In Genesis 42, 16, Joseph threatens to keep nine of his brothers in prison until the other one, Benjamin, is brought back. Let me ask you something. Have you ever felt the offense of having to prove yourself to your closest friends? Have you? Then I want you to be encouraged. Guess what? Jesus is testing you. He's in jail for three days so his servants could listen to their conversations and get information concerning his home and the events of the past 22 years of his life to know the true attitudes of their hearts. Let me ask you something. Have you ever felt detained by God? By God. Have you ever felt detained by God or given an attitude check by those that are of authority in your life? Then be overjoyed. Jesus is testing you. Joseph in Genesis 42 and 43, he binds Simeon and keeps him in prison for a whole year, thus punishing him for his cruelty and perhaps for being the leader of a plot against him. Let me ask you something again. Have you ever felt disciplined for longer than you felt it was justified for? I know the truth of that one. Then you need to rejoice. God is treating you like sons. Jesus is testing you. Joseph puts the money that they gave back into the sacks so as to test their honesty and to see if they were as covetous as they were when they sold him in Genesis 42? Do you ever feel like God carried out a calculated maneuver against you? Yeah, he did. Because he's testing you to measure your growth. Jesus is testing you. Joseph gives his brothers hospitality to make them feel keenly his disappointment in them when they were accused of robbery after such good treatment that he gave them in Genesis 43. Let me ask you something. Have you ever received the goodness of God on the back end of foolish behavior? He did it to humble you. He's testing you. Joseph gives Benjamin a meal five times bigger than his other brothers. Watch this. To see if they would hate and be jealous of another of Rachel's sons. Have you ever displayed jealousy towards someone when they receive five times of what you thought you deserved? Jesus is testing you. Joseph puts their money back into their sex a second time to see how they would answer when accused in Genesis 44. Ask yourself the last time that you felt like you have been here before. You ever feel like I've been around the mountain? Lord, why are you doing this to me again? I've been around this mountain before, Lord. I thought this was something that was cured in my heart. Why are we here again? He's testing you. Joseph put his personal cup in Benjamin's sack to see what brothers, what the brothers would do if Benjamin were detained and imprisoned in Genesis 44. How did you react the third time you encountered what was blatantly the hand of God that you have been through before? 
Were you frustrated with God? Were you frustrated about the amount of times that God has confronted you with this? Or were you excited that you get to rip the basics? Jesus is testing you. Joseph arrests his brothers again and put them on trial for returning evil for good in Genesis 44. Saints, when difficulty, hardship, persecution, famine, prison, or penalty come your way, do you get overwhelmed with injustice? Or does your sense of entitlement overcome you? Do you forget the God that God reigns as just and sovereign over the just and the unjust? Do you know that he reigns on the just and the unjust? Do you remember that we're a fallen race? That Jesus said that there was none good and that when you receive anything good in this dark and depraved world, that it is a blessing from God? Jesus is testing you. Joseph accuses his brothers of stealing from the palace, a crime punishable by death in Genesis 44. Saints, when the sentence of death comes for you, will you blame God because you have the right to stay your execution? Evaluate your suffering or forego your inevitable cost to endure it? Wow. Look at the last time in Genesis 44 that Joseph tests his brothers and you'll see why he was testing them. In Genesis 44, 17, Joseph threatens to keep only Benjamin in prison for a crime. Watch this. Listen to me. To see if they were as anxious to get rid of their father's present favorite, favorite son as they had been to get rid of their father's past favorite son. Why did he test them 12 different times? Joseph was looking to see if they had undergone transformation just like he had. His testing exposed their transformation. He did them a favor. They had been transformed. They didn't know it, but he knew it. God had him on a journey being transformed, had them on a journey being transformed, and finally again they're in one room, and he knows how to extract the gold out of them so they could see what God had done in their life. Wow. His testing exposed their transformation, and now they knew what Joseph suspected. They were not the men that they once were because they had been tested just like God had tested Joseph and made them fruitful. Saints, in the end, when your life is over, when this window of opportunity has passed, Will you just be formed or will you be transformed? Will you be tested or will you be tested and approved? Every time you are tested, you are being tested by Jesus for Jesus. To ensure that you are not what you once were. Man, that's good news. Walking through a journey of being forged in fire can feel like the duration that you just had to sit through in order to listen to this message. Your flesh doesn't like it. You want to get to the point. You want to expedite the process. But you want to, you want to get there and not actually have to do what other men have done to get there. Maybe even King Jesus, as though he said the model. God is all seeing. He's all knowing. He's all present, right? He's not testing you for him to see what is inside of him. He knows what's inside of you. He is testing you so that you will know what's inside of you. And he wants you to know that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And he wants you to know that he who is in you is for you. Hmm. Don't you know that Joseph had to go through hell to be in position to save his brothers from famine? Well, Jesus had to go through hell and conquer it. 
just to save you from yours. You know what hell is? You think it's that thing that's coming. No, hell is, is if you just stay the same that you are today. A little bit of heaven comes down when you're transformed into the image of Christ, the dream that your father had for you. Genesis 42, 8. And although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams he had for them. Wow. Joseph lived compelled by a God-given dream that included his brothers. King Jesus lives with a God-given dream that includes you as well. Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined or predetermined to be conformed into the likeness of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brothers and those that he predetermined or predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, guess what? <laughs> he also glorified. Mm. what then shall we say in response to this? If God be for us, then who can be against us? 1 Peter 4.12 says this, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you might be overjoyed when the glory, the glory of God is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Jesus, you are blessed. <laughs> For the spirit of the glory of God rests on you. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. What are the meek? Blessed! You are blessed because you're tested. When you're tested, you are blessed. And when you need to get blessed, you just say, God, test me. I want to know the metal that you put in me. I don't want to talk about it. I want to be about it. I want to live in that reality. You said I've been given a backbone of steel. Show me. Stand with me. This morning, we're not going to go back and worship. This morning, we're going to move forward in fellowship and allow iron to sharpen iron. God's word is an anvil that'll wear out every hammer. And what is being forged in between that hammer and that anvil is you a firebrand for King Jesus? Anything less is not what he is forging. But for you, saints, you are a fired up, firebrand, son and daughter of the living God. Amen. You accept anything less and you are not accepting the king of glory who's coming with fire in his eyes with a white robe that's dipped in the blood of his enemies while he treads the wine press of his fury. He is a judge and he's a loving judge. He is a lion and so are you. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, Lord God, to be forged into the image of the likeness of your son. Mighty God, that you are, we thank you for extracting the gold out of us. We thank you, Lord God, for giving us new life, new empowerment, and a new family, Lord God, to walk this out with. We thank you, mighty God, and we bless you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, Amen.